Okay, let us go and get started with session 18 of 120B, 220B. Today will actually be our last session of like presenting any new material to you. Uh, we're gonna try to like uh, finish up with plumbing systems, talk a little bit about electrical systems, and finally get back to looking at that whole issue of how you integrate things together and bring all these different models of all the different systems together into a single integrated model that you can then use to sort of see if oh, you have any spatial conflicts, any sort of uh, clashes that need to be addressed. Okay, uh, what? In terms of where we are in the overall process, next Tuesday at class time, you should be ready to go ahead and do a little sharing of your project. And as you think about sharing your project, realize that, oh, what do we have in here? Focus that out there. Okay. What you'll be doing is not necessarily giving an exhaustive presentation on your topic, but what you want to do is basically present your building as a high level overview. You want to go through and just introduce it, kind of give it a high level um, overview of really what you were trying to accomplish, what the program was, what your overall design strategy was, and then think about just system highlights of each of the different systems. So again, there's no way you can talk in 10 minutes time about the details of kind of your sustainable design features and your structural systems and your mechanical systems and all your plumbing systems. So go and think about the things that are a little bit unique and different, places where you learn something in trying to implement some of these ideas in your specific building, something that yeah, I think might be a little bit unique and different. So if you have incredibly long spans or big cantilevers or multi-units or anything that's a little bit different about your building, Kind of think about what you might share with that. Because again, our goal isn't necessarily to be exhaustive as much as it is to kind of like share the high level things. Okay, so go through highlights of these different systems, in particular your sort of sustainable design features, what your original strategy was, and how you actually came to implement some of those things. Those are good things. So even look back at that original uh, briefing in your entry in your design journal about what you thought you were going to try and do with the building and kind of think back about how you accomplish some of those things. And I always like to think about things in terms of your achievements, the things that went really well that you're proud of. The challenges, and we've all had challenges. Along the way, we've all hit different sort of issues where we would have liked to have done it different ways, and either because of the complexity of the building or the modeling challenges, things don't always go the way we want, and we sometimes have to do some compromises. And just really lessons learned, so that is, Given what you know today, how would you advise people doing this again to do it a little bit differently? Okay, because that's really where it always gets sort of interesting. It's like, yeah, somehow we always go through this, and boy, if you had to do it all again based on what you know now, you'd sort of approach it a little bit differently. So that's the focus of that. So just be ready for next Tuesday for spending 10 minutes of fame and fortune. If you can't be here next Tuesday to do that, what you'll do is you can actually just record something offline. Like, uh, so we can get you set up, if anyone has, oh, send something out. But you can just basically record something uh, just you know, on your Mac or on your PC. as though you were giving the presentation to us, but just kind of walking us through and talking us through some slides. So if you want to see some examples of what people have done in the past on YouTube from the past uh, couple class sessions, there are examples out there. Just always go to the last class session. But if you do go out to YouTube, oh, what should you do? Just go searching on YouTube. Go to Bimtopia. And if you go to any of the last few sessions, oh, let's go back to winter or something like that, you'll find basically, oh, they almost always are in class session 20. So. Here's the winter ones. I'll pop through there. Gonna zoom out here somewhere. You can sort of see what people do. Again, a lot of people, because it's our nature, will go through and put together very detailed slides. And that's okay. I would say use slides though to the extent that's the Gustavo's. Use slides to the extent that it helps you tell the story very crisply and cleanly. Okay. Don't worry about deep ending on it, because in 10 minutes you only got so many slides to work with. But to the extent that having the slides will help you just sort of 
you know, practice your way through it and guide you and make sure you cover the high level things nicely. Think about like uh, using them in that way. So there's the little daylighting analysis he did. Uh, here's his mechanical system. And you'll see at a high level, he's just kind of talking about what his system was. He has a kind of just graphic that shows how it was implemented. Yeah, it's kind of at that level. Okay, along the way, we've all had those funny cases where when you tried to put it all together, the air handler and something didn't connect together and some elbow never fit. And you know, we all know that story, so you, know, you, don't, need to, you don't need to tell that story because we've all heard been through that one. Okay, so yeah, strategy, stack your restrooms. <laughs> Generally a good strategy. It's funny, when I first say you should stack your restrooms, at first it doesn't really register, but then when you try to you know, do all the plumbing, you realize the advantage of doing something like that. Okay. So take advantage of some of that stuff. Okay, let's go back over here. So go through, think about your final presentations and what you're gonna present next Tuesday. Any questions on that? Do those people have a pretty good sense? Can, can you all be here next Tuesday? Is there, okay, beautiful. You know, I don't have any particular uh, you know, order to it all, so you can sort of volunteer for whatever order you would want to be. I'll probably put out a sign-up sign sheet so you can decide if you wanna be early or late. Everyone likes to be in different spots. Whether you're an early presenter or a late presenter, everyone has something. But basically, we'll somehow get through it and share some things. Finally, the very final thing you'll do for the class is you'll post to your design journal you know, your final models okay, that uh, have your A360 models. Um, you'll post a, basically a final journal entry that really sort of summarizes the whole thing in terms of what you're coming up with. Again, if you look at some of the design journal entries from years past or quarters past, you can actually see how people summarize that. So that's your final chance to sort of tell the whole story. What you need to do in terms of finally finishing up. Okay, so realize that Tuesday, your final model day may not be finished. Yeah, it's okay to do that working products at that point. That is super. For your final model, you can kind of keep on working on this as long as you want to. I'm going to encourage you not to sort of drag it out over finals week because, yeah, you don't want to use all that time. You have other things like entertaining parents who are coming to town, other things that are going on. But you have ultimately till, oh, what is it? Um, it's after finals week. Is it the Tuesday after finals week? There's a day that I have to submit grades. And actually, I think this quarter it's different. I think it's on Thursday if you're graduating Tuesday if you're not graduating. There's like a specific deadline that all the grades have to be turned in. So as long as you get them in by the grading deadline, I can take a look at the final uh, journal entry and kind of put it all together. So you have some leeway, okay, in terms of that. But in general, if you get it done at the, by the end of next week's super, if you need to drag through finals week, again, that's okay. Take the time you need to. I'd rather you do it in a way that you feel like you're really getting it and having some fun as opposed to just trying to rush it all through and trying to cram it all in by Sunday night at some arbitrary deadline because that would just be an arbitrary deadline. Okay, so does that sort of make sense? Okay, at the same time, don't just kind of leave it lingering or say that, oh, well, gee, if I have another four days, I should do all these new things. So scope creep is your enemy, especially at this part. Just kind of, yeah. You did it. You got it done. You learned what you needed to. You put a bow on it and yeah, put it in a nice place where you can share it with so many people. Close up. If you need help rendering and stuff like that, we have a real expert over here who did a very fine job of presenting his project. So uh, you might uh, ask him for tips because uh, he came across very effectively, I must say. Okay. Back over here in terms of what we're talking about, we're going to finish up with plumbing systems today. For the most part, we talked a lot about plumbing systems in terms of, oh, restroom scenarios and putting them together. What I want to show you today to finish up plumbing systems, though, of all the systems is fire sprinkler systems because that is one of the other systems that sort of, oh, impacts us as we think about uh, trying to go through and integrate everything that needs to get into that ceiling plane that needs to be there. In particular, let's just go ahead and talk about our strategy. So the idea is, when we're thinking about fire sprinklers, this is actually a high pressure water system. So typically it's not the same water system as your domestic hot and cold water. We want a lot of pressure behind those sprinklers because when they're needed, and they're not needed that often, we really want a lot of them to throw water simultaneously 
and you don't want it dribbling out and not being effective. So, if you look around this room, for example, you can spot, as best I can see, six fire sprinklers. We have um, them up over in the corner, in the back, there's two in the center, and two over here on the side. Um, the way those are spaced is really based on the notion of if you take the amount of pressure behind it and a throw distance about how far it can actually spread out, you want to make sure the whole room is covered. So they're placed in such a way that if the pressure and the flow behind it is great enough, everything will get at least single covered, maybe double covered. Okay, so we space them all around. You can see in this room, what are they? They're about every one, two, three, four, about every 16 feet apart or something like that. So that's actually a perfectly reasonable way to go through and put them in there. What we are going to do in terms of trying to model a system like this is we're going to go through and put sprinklers on either a ceiling surface or just up in the air, but we're going to put it up in a ceiling plant, and then we're going to connect them all together. We're going to connect them all together using a piping system. Now, as we go through and put our sprinklers as well as the piping system, a big thing to do is basically watch out for the heights. In general, if we have sprinklers that are located in the ceiling pointing down, we want the pipes to be above them. Okay, if you actually have to put them below, you're going to study a little U-shape coats in them. So in general, we're going to try and get it above it. And we will tend to use a feature called auto-routing to put them in place. Okay, where auto-routing is really, oh, it's just Revit going through and trying to figure out what is the most efficient network path that would connect all the different endpoints. You'll find that it works pretty well for sprinklers because sprinklers tend to lay out in fairly regular patterns. And if you put them up in the ceiling at their own separate level, you tend not to get too much interference. But we're going to find that auto routing may or may not do a good job. So if it doesn't, you can always adjust things manually. So you, know, you could even auto route your toilets or auto route your sinks, but it tends to do a pretty poor job if it's a very complex layout. So I'll use auto routing for these type of systems. But even here, what I'll say is go through and figure out where your main riser and your main trunk is first, because you're going to connect into that. If you give it a little bit of help, then it'll understand what it should connect into. OK, so let's think about fire sprinklers and where we can go through and put them in. Let's go over. And if we go to Revit, let me close up my little dynamo action here. And see what else we got going on. Got too much going on over here. Okay, let me say open. And we will go out to, oh, I'm going to go to session, actually, I'm going to go back to 19, or excuse me, uh, 17. So I think the example I want is still back there. Plumbing examples. See what I have. I have some sprinklers start. Let's go to 18B1. Open that up. And what you're going to see is it's that same little four classroom building that I use as a unit test case for a lot of these things. But what we're going to do is place some sprinklers on the ceiling. Look at this little building kind of hanging around right here. You're kind of looking at half of the building right now. You can sort of see the restroom still plumbed. It's kind of hanging around over here on the side. You can sort of see the gray water and the domestic uh, sanitary all kind of happening over here. That's looking pretty good. You will see that on the ceiling of this space, there are sealers, a little sprinkler heads. Okay, little sprinkler pendants hosted half inch. Actually, I just did something which is kind of a force of habit that I'll kind of tell you about, that I'll warn you about more doing. OK, 
Okay. Yeah, in making these videos and putting them out there, I have been beaten up unmercifully by people on the internet for you doing two different things. We're getting sprinklers. One is, I'll often call them sprinkler heads, which people will rightfully remind me are not what these are. Sprinkler heads are what you have in your lawn. Okay, these are just called sprinklers. Okay, so not time for that. <laughs> but the internet loves to complain. Okay, so these are sprinklers. The other thing to watch out for is you'll notice they're actually located in the middle of ceiling tiles over here. In an early video, I was helping someone do some video recording and she put them right on the crosses of the ceiling and people who are good in this field were very adamant about her telling me you never put the fire sprinklers at the intersections, you always put them in the middle of the place. So just little random things to watch out for. Okay. But you'll see in these two different rooms, I have a layout that has four different sprinklers. Okay. If I want to go through and put in some more, let's just kind of find them all. Where they live is under systems. You can find sprinklers. They're right next to plumbing fixtures. You'll see you have different types over here. We have this type that says sprinkler pendant hosted. There are actually other types. We have pendants, we have pendants on a drop, pendants that have a guard on them, different size of pipes. We have a lot of different types of pendants. We could hang them off of walls, we can I guess, put them off the ceiling. The guard is whether it has one of those little cages on it that sort of uh, keeps you from accidentally knocking into it. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and put the pendant. We'll go ahead and do that. Notice it's hosted, and when things are hosted, you have the choice of putting on a vertical face, which in this case, that's not what I want to do. I'm going to put them just on a face, and that face is actually going to be when I hover over the ceiling. I'm in the ceiling plan right now, so it'll basically attach itself to the ceiling. Okay. I could do it the other way. I could say, let's just put them on the work plane, and if I put them on the work plane, then this elevation is going to be important. Okay, but by putting them on the face, the nice thing is if that ceiling moves, the sprinklers will move with it. Okay, so that buys you a nice little bit of uh, kind of hierarchical dependency. So I'll place them on face, and I'll just go ahead and drop one over here. I'll drop one over here. I'm trying to line them up, and not doing a very good job. One over here. Over there. Okay. And you could array these around. There's all sorts of things you can do. But that'll be uh, my fire sprinklers. We'll go ahead and put those pendants there hanging on the ceiling. Again, how are they located? It's really this whole notion, and it's they're all rated. There's actually a whole separate design discipline that goes into this where they're rated just based on the water pressure behind them, okay, and the flow that's coming out, how far they can throw, and by throw. I mean that distance. Okay, and usually they're set up in such a way that you'll get some nice overlap like that between things. Now, because I put them there, if that was actually the distance, this probably wouldn't be a good layout because they probably have that little bit of uncovered distance in there. But I'm thinking if we use the rule if I'm in this room, it looks like given our water pressure, it's probably closer to every 16 feet, okay, which is why over here, like just putting them at the four corners is probably sufficient because that will cover the whole area adequately. Again, they're typically on their own water system. The reason being, if they were on the same water system as that domestic hot and cold water, well, you wouldn't want the pressure compromised or the flow compromised if actually the water is being used for something else. But also, they're under such a pressure that if you had that much pressure in the toilet flush or in the sinks, when you open the sinks, you'd be blasted by the water kind of coming out. It's really just too high a pressure. Okay, so we tend to keep them in their own separate little systems. So they're hanging around out here. They're looking pretty good. We would like to sort of pile these together into a plumbing system. And we could do that just the way we have in the past. We could say that, hey, Let's go over to a nearby systems. Say, let's put a pipe in here. And we can let's go through and put something into the fire protection system. What? Okay, put some pipes in there of some diameter. 
and we can start routing them together and connecting into. So I can, if I'm going to follow this scenario, let me go through and oh, put them at a reasonable level. So right now, what? So I'm going to be offset from level one. I forget where my ceiling is here. It's probably about eight feet up. If I put them at about nine feet up, again, watch the heights. I'm going to put them at 10, just to be on the safe side. Although, actually, why don't I be smart about this and sort of see where my ceiling is? It's at eight feet. OK. So let's go through and put a pipe in here. I can put that pipe at um, nine feet be fine. Run some pipe down the middle. Cancel. Oh, that's interesting in terms of what it wants me to do. Let me do a couple different things here. I'm going to turn on the wireframe just so I can see past the ceiling. There we go. And there's the pipe. Okay, I can draw pipes and stuff like that. And even after I have that pipe, I can connect things into it. So for example, I could come over here and say connect into. And it'll connect across. Connect in here. But this isn't necessary because it actually does a pretty good job of laying things automatically. So let me show you what that looks like instead. I'm just going to undo a couple steps so that um, back to where we were. So a few undos. Okay. And we're going to go through and try and route these things together. And here's the way it works. These sprinklers are generally understood to be part of a system. Okay. So when I go through and choose one of the sprinklers, okay, I can go through and say, let's create a new piping system. They're almost always part of a system. So I can say, great, I'll grab a system. It's going to be a certain type of fire protection system. They all have different names or numbers. It's a fire protection system. I can call it my sprinkler one, whatever you want to call it. We're ready to go. Now notice this system currently has that one sprinkler in it. If I'd like to get more of the sprinklers into the system, what I will do is say, let's edit the system. And I can then do some adding. I'll add you. I'll add you. Let's grab all my sprinklers. Super. Looking good? Okay, so if I have my, in this case, 12 different sprinklers added into that system, we're looking pretty good. At this point, I don't have any special system equipment. If I have anything that's going to serve this system, I could choose it here, but I don't for a sprinkler. Let me finish this. Okay, and those are now known as a system. So let's go back and choose the system and keep on going. Okay, so now I have all six or qualities in here in my system. I can go through now and either edit the system, kind of adding or removing things, or generating a layout. And that's where the fun starts, because if you generate a layout, it'll go through and kind of auto route these things. So again, let me show you what I did. I started with basically taking the thing Okay, I put it into a system. Okay, so there's the system. I can edit the system. That'll show me all those different pieces. What I want to do is actually just finish editing it and choose the whole system by tabbing it. Okay, and now I can generate a layout for it. So if we generate a layout, here's how it works. Okay. In terms of the layout, it's going to show me some different solutions. I can kind of put my own layout in here, but if I wanted to show me some solutions, here's what it can do. You have different ways of networking these things together. You can almost think about this main blue line as being the trunk, the biggest one, and these green lines being branches that are coming off. Okay, but 
you're basically connecting together a system where the blue line is the higher one and the hierarchy. The green ones are kind of flowing out, so that blue packets would be bigger than the green ones. That all sort of makes sense. And there's different strategies. Here's a network strategy. There's layout one. There's layout two. So that's not too bad looking. Let's go for another. Let's go for the perimeter strategies. The perimeter strategies look like, let's see what we got. That's kind of a, still a T-shaped strategy or an H-shaped strategy. This is one that you might like, kind of a U-shaped strategy. That's another kind of an H-shaped one. That's a U going in the other direction. Okay. Let's see what an intersection strategy looks like. This looks like somehow it's based on the number of intersections. Again, coming up with that same sort of strategy. Ah, that's an interesting one over there. Kind of a U-shaped one on the end. That's kind of a funky one. It's kind of all biased towards this top line with a little L-shaped branch is coming off of it. Okay, but find the one you like is really what the rule would be. So I don't mind that one. That actually looks pretty good in terms of, oh, this is sort of based on the notion that the smallest pipe is happening here. There's this intermediate sort of pipe here, but then this orange pipe is going to get pretty chunky because it's got a lot of flow going to it. Since my mechanical room is over here, this isn't bad if I can branch in and kind of go over that way. But choose the one you like, and when you find the strategy you like, just say finish it. Okay. This element has an open connection. It should be sealed with an end cap. Let's see what it's talking about. I might still have a pipe hanging around here somewhere. Four things have an open connection. Let's see if I can figure out where they are. These are warnings. Let's see what we say here. What, ha what is this mystery element? So there's some pipe. Okay. Let's take a look at that pipe. If I come through and choose one of those pipes, for example, I'll look at two, I can say show it, and let's see what it is. Is it the pipes over there? I'm looking for a view that's actually going to show me which one. It looks like the orange one. actually complaining for the wrong reason. I think what's really happening is I happen to run that pipe that it's conflicting with right now. And this sprinkler pipe is coming through, and this other pipe, which I was planning to connect into it, is coming through and teeing into it in sort of a funny way. So that's kind of considered an ugly connection. But what I want to do is, this is a pipe that's back in the mechanical room. This is coming out from it. What I want to do is just tie those things together. So for example, if I took this one, and I can do this a number of different ways. If I say trim it, I can choose this line and trim that to it. OK, and that's a little bit better. It puts a little connection in there. So this is a pretty good looking sprinkler system right here. It's basically just connecting all the different sprinklers together, the pendants together, bringing them back down the main trunks, and then this is connecting back to the mechanical room where we probably have some sort of riser that goes off to the main building valve. Okay, and that can kind of go up or down or wherever it needs to. So sprinklers tend to be pretty easy. It's like, in general, the auto routing works. If the auto routing doesn't work, you can go through and adjust them manually. No problem there. The biggest issue with sprinklers tends to be just working on this height. Because depending on where your structures are and your ductwork is and anything else you have running in the ceiling, you have to sort of squeeze these in here too. So if these have a height of, for example, 9, and that's going to be a conflict for you, you might need to make that nine foot six or something. And when you do, 
Oh, that's interesting. I figured they'd all jump. Control Z. That's the whole chain. Ah, I usually think about those all jumping at the same time. This kind of makes me wonder if this is really has what I need over there. It looks like it doesn't. That's actually interesting. That doesn't quite look right in terms of what's going on. So what I'm going to do is bring that up to 9 foot 6. Maybe that's what it was complaining about. Although, I don't, I don't think it should have done that to me. I think in the auto routing, it should have done a better job of that. Let me go through and trim these two against each other. Get a nice elbow in there. I think the error may be that since this is right over the sprinkler head, okay, it's having trouble making like a three-legged connection there. So my best strategy might be to go ahead and take this line and just move it down. I'm going to move it off to the uh, right a little bit. so that when these things connect together, now I can connect this into not quite enough room. OK. Let's go a little further. So as I'm struggling with this, you might recognize that the same problem I'm having here is the same problem you have everywhere, where it's just this whole issue of, you know, it needs to make the connections, and the thing that gets you in trouble more than anything is just the physical space available. OK, that's a little bit better. Now, I don't like that as a demo, because for the most part, it generally does a really good job. Let's see what's happening over in this corner. I bet this corner is still a little bit messy, too. So if I trim this to that, make the corner, should be able to trim this too. Let me make sure I'm at the same height. Nine foot six, nine foot zero. Okay, never trust anything in 3D. Nine foot six. So I'll TR trim those two against each other. Get the elbow in there. And then bring that up. Beautiful. Okay, we can do all the same things that we're used to doing. You can do all the sprinkler and pipe sizing stuff that we're used to. So for example, if you choose this guy under piping systems, no, not there. Where'd it go? I gotta find it yet. You. Select the equipment. Where's my pipe sizing on this one? I know you're a system. Hmm. I'm going to wonder where that's not in there. But not too much. And I'm going to go over to the user interface and show you that if you go to the system browser, you can see somewhere in our piping systems, we have our hot water or cold water, and I have our fire protection systems. And here's sprinkler system one, the one I just created. You can see it has all the little pendants in there. And then go through and do a little computation. Okay, so that's what I want to get to you about fire sprinklers. Fire sprinklers tend to be a fairly easy system. The big thing you have to worry about is just pipes and making sure that the pipes run through, they don't slip through the things. So, any questions on that, or does it sort of make sense? What do you think? Yes? So when you create a system, does that work for larger buildings as well, or are there a certain number of sprinklers that you can bring together? It'll do its best job, but I would definitely do it sort of a wing at a time. For like in your building, you have like sort of two buildings in the central area. Mm -hmm. I would do as many as sort of makes sense, what is it, that you can control at the same time. So for your office building, I just do the first floor. Do that this one. 
Then I do the second floor and do those as one, and then try connecting those together. Because okay. if, it's, if it's too big, what will happen is, for example, in your building, it might put the pipes just all across the atrium. Right. So think about them in terms of compact zones. So for you, every apartment has its own sprinkler system. Actually, same thing for you, Carl. Probably every apartment has its own, well, I think about that. Nah. Well, we probably did. The whole building would have sprinklers. Well, it varies. I got to think about that for individual units. I think they tend to sort of be sprinkled in such a way that the individual unit comes on, but they don't come on in the whole building. OK. You got a couple big zones. You definitely can sort of split into separate zones in terms of, yeah, because if you don't want all the sprinklers to come on, yeah, you know, a fire in a zone, you do that. Okay, that is the gist of sprinklers, but let's go ahead and continue with our very last systems that we want to think about. Okay, oh, and in terms of your buildings, and as you think about getting ready for your final presentations and stuff like that, again, you'll want to have your structure, you'll want to have some notion of the HVAC for plumbing. What I'd recommend is get one of the restrooms. If you get more of them done because they're all stacked, oh, yeah, super. But yeah, if you can really do the detail behind one of the restrooms, you're in good shape. Sprinklers, you're right on the margin about really, if you don't make it to sprinklers, that's okay. You know, it's, we're kind of at the end of different systems. You know sort of what it would take to involve them, and the big thing is just trying to allow the space. But if you can put a couple sprinklers in an area, super. Okay, so. We definitely, towards the end of the class, get to this part where everyone sort of ends at different points. But we all sort of run out of time. So if you get to sprinklers, that's on the, it's definitely on the, you call it either the frosting side or the, it's the gravy side. It's like, it's not the meat. So go ahead and like uh, get the meat if you can. But yeah, don't panic if you don't have a chance to get those into your building. Okay. My last system that I want to tell you about that we're going to put in there is the electrical systems. And the electrical systems, in some ways, work so much like the other systems in that it's really all based upon different endpoints and then ultimately servicing and feeding those endpoints. Now, as we go through and start thinking about electrical systems, there's all sorts of stuff we can put into our building. The biggest systems that we tend to worry about are the power system. And the power system is the part that's supplying power to the outlets, the 110 volt outlets and the 220 volt outlets we might need, kind of scattered around. But we tend to think about power systems being a little bit different than lighting systems. They both have this notion of these different, whether you think about them as terminals or plumbing fixtures, in this case, you can think about all these receptacles as being an endpoint. As we start thinking about lighting systems, we have the different fixtures that we put in are the endpoints, and then we often have switches that then control those. Okay, but think of them as basically being a series of different terminals that we're going to connect together with wiring systems. Now, as we're going to model electrical systems, you're going to find out that for many buildings, okay, we model the endpoints and we schematically put in the wires, but we don't actually put in all the conduits and wire them 100% precisely. Because it's a lot of work to do that, and very often what happens is the electricians on site can kind of figure out the best paths just based upon what they're seeing and all the other interferences. Now, if you're working on a very high precision building, like a lab or a hospital, that it actually is very critical to control the location of where all the conduits are going to run because there's so many potentials for interference. Okay. They will model all the conduits. Okay. And you can model those too. But typically, for most of the buildings of the scale that we're doing, people wouldn't model the conduits. Or maybe they'd put in the main area, the main distribution, some sort of a tray or a conduit. But they wouldn't do it to all the endpoints. Okay, So actually, just so you even get a sense of what I'm talking about, in this building, you can actually sort of see some of the conduits. Actually, you sort of see two different things. You see, for example, okay, here are the, uh, you know, the switches for the lighting. This is a low voltage kind of uh, thermostat that's going to the HVAC system. You'll see here are the metal studs, and there's this little flexi piece of conduit going on down here. This is coming to, it's kind of interesting which one's coming to, whether it's coming to the light or whether it's coming over here. There's this flexi conduit 
no one takes the time to model that because it sort of ends up wherever it ends up. This is actually a hard piece of conduit, so that may have been measured or kind of precisely planned. Over here, if you're looking up at the corner of the room, you can see there's a whole series of conduit running in that little bay, kind of right around the how to log in up in there. There's some smaller ones, some bigger ones. Because there's a lot of things running in a dense location, those probably actually got planned, as opposed to, you see the fuzzy ones, kind of inevitable locations, which are, uh, those are probably just running in the field based on what they need to be. But it's all going to start by just putting in those endpoints and then connecting them together. So let us talk about how you do that, because it's actually pretty straightforward. If you want to go over to Revit and get a feel for this, come pop it on over, and we'll just wire some things together. The example that you can pull up that shows how to do some of these things is under session 18. So if you want to go out to 18 and grab that, They have the same model file that has a few power outlets in there as well as some lighting. Let's start by talking about power. That tends to be the easy one. Looks like this is a power floor plan. I did this with, looks like there's actually an electrical template. You see I got my little building down here. Let's go ahead and kind of uh, look at what's in there. We have a series of, these are little receptacles mounted along the wall. If you choose one, you'll see that it has properties. It sort of is a duplex receptacle, kind of a standard type. A duplex receptacle is kind of what you're looking at right here, as these two little call receptacles or outlets to it. Okay, it is mounted right now 18 inches off the ground, which is the way you put them all now in commercial buildings. So 18 inches above the ground for a standard receptacle. In homes, we used to put those at 12 inches. Okay, if you're going to put them on countertops, you need to raise them up a little bit. Okay. There's other random dimensions for you. Switches, like over there, tend to be at 48 inches above the floor. Okay, so by default, it's going to come in at 18. You'll see there's some different types of receptacles. There are standard ones in GFCI. Okay, ground fault circuit interrupt are the GFCI ones. That is, the standard ones are pretty much what we have in most locations. And non-wet locations, where we're not worried about a shock hazard, we'll tend to put standard receptacles. GFCI uh, receptacles have a uh, circuit interrupter somewhere along the line. So if we have a bunch of things that are GFCI, like over, we're showing over here, okay, there's going to be an interrupter so that if a short is detected, it'll cut the power off right away. Okay? So we tend to put those in bathrooms, we tend to put those on kitchen counters, anywhere there might be wetness that if the wetness got in touch with the power of an appliance of some type, that rather than electrocuting or shocking someone, it would cut off the power as soon as it detects or detects it as a short circuit. Okay. So as you're placing outlets, it's pretty easy. What you'll do is under systems, go to, oh, let's find it. I think it's considered a device, electrical fixture. That'll bring up the different types. Let me go to a standard one. You just sort of have a height above the ground, like one foot six or whatever you want it to be. It's associated, there's different sort of types in terms of what the voltage is that's associated with it. If you have a mixed voltage 220, or if you're working in a metric system, you might want to have the 220s as your defaults. But we'll tend to put them in, and I'll put one over here, put one over here, put one over here. So those all have a height. They actually show up in 3D also. So if you want to see them in 3D, they often will show up in your renderings and sometimes get in the way. Well, let's take a look at that. 
So here we are inside the building and the little outlet's floating around right there. So we got outlets. Let me go back to the power view. So we start with putting our outlets in there. They're actually pretty good. Notice they all actually belong to systems too. So what we'll tend to do is actually start routing these together into systems and bring them back to a panel. We'll sort of route them together into a circuit, okay? And then bring them back to a panel of some type. If you want to create a power system, what you do is choose one of them and say create a system. It's going to say, hey, you got a system? Great. Let's add some things into it. I'm going to add this one and that one and this one and that one all together. Oh, that says it's already part of another circuit. We'll be removed from the original circuits and add this one. Okay. So I got five outlets that are part of my circuit right now. If I have a panel, I can choose the panel. It looks like I don't have a panel just yet. I need to put a panel in here to do that. Let me cancel that. I'll just say finish editing the circuit. Okay. So what's going to happen? Those five outlets are all considered to be part of a circuit. So if I go back to that system browser again, I go to electrical, power. So I have some pendant lights, I have some duplex circuits, and I have these guys over here. Okay, so if I choose that one, okay. And often we'll give these a name. For example, oh, I'll call that Power One or Power 101 or something like that. You tend to give them all names because you want them to, uh, let me see if I can get the name in there. Load name. Schedule circuit notes. Circuit number. Hmm. Looking for where I put the name in there. That looks like notes. That doesn't look right. This is kind of hidden from me right now. So think about why I can't get the name in there. But it tallies it all up. What you can see is that the load on that branch is now 900. Okay, now. Very often when we go through and put in these, we don't actually show the routing. But if we do want to show the routing of the wiring, what you can do is choose it. You'll notice at this point, if I select that circuit, it's schematically going through and putting in these little arcs that are connecting things together. That's pretty much the way we show it. Although we know the wire isn't going to go this way, if we showed it right in the walls, all the wires would be on top of each other. It would be really hard to figure out. So we tend to show it in this kind of shortcut arc system. So if you want to put some wire in, you say arc wire, and then it will show the routing you have in mind. And that will let people know that that's that circuit. So we can tie those together. Oh, in the same sense, I could take these guys over here. Let me create a system out of them. Edit the circuit. I'll add this one into it over here. Say finish that circuit. If I choose that, and again, wire them. Okay, I'll have another circuit that starts to tie them together. So it's pretty much just kind of saying where they are. And then in a lot of buildings, when you go back to the main control panel, this will be you know, P101, this will be P102, and we'll distinguish the power uh, circuits versus the lighting circuits. Okay, so you sort of tie those together. Power tends to work out pretty well. If you need to sort of have an outlet in an unusual location, not to worry. We'll come back and say, Systems, device, put another GFCI outlet in here somewhere. This one I'm going to put over here, but it's going to be on a countertop or in some special height location that I need. So I'm going to say, take it, and I'm going to put you at like three foot six. 
Okay, and that'll rep itself, represent itself accurately. I could then go back in and take this. Uh, where do I want to do? I want to get the circuit, edit the circuit, and add that to the circuit. Notice that doesn't have the line in there yet. So if I want to add the line in there, I need to re-add it. OK, so power tends to work out to be pretty easy. The other thing that you want to worry about is we're going through a thing about building is lighting. And lighting is sort of a very critical thing as you um, think about finding what you need in the building. We talked about lighting from the daylighting standpoint in terms of trying to get natural lighting as much as possible. But for night times and place times when daylighting isn't available to supplement the daylighting, we often have to go through and put in some sort of electrical fixtures. So there are electrical fixtures available. Let's kind of take a look at them. The idea is, actually, let's do this. Come on back. Let's do, let's do our break now. Come on back in five. When you come on back, we'll do our electrical lighting fixtures, talk about them, and we'll integrate this all together in BIM 360. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's pause this. Come on back, and we'll give her the big wrap up. <laughs>